So Merle's home, overdid it yesterday again. And so, I don't know what to tell you. He's gonna do what he's gonna do, and if he works himself, if he hurts himself, <laughs> then we'll stay home. That's the way it goes. But anyway, um, you might as well get used to seeing me up here because next week, Pastor's gonna be gone. And, and if someone else would like to come up here and talk, I guess I got, got the thing for next week. And maybe the 19th also. And, and else, somebody wants to talk other than me. Um, I'm not a preacher. I uh, do the best I can. I can't remember things and come up with things uh, in spontaneously like uh, Pastor does. That's the word I was trying to remember, spontaneous. And uh, I think of things in the middle of the night. <laughs> And then in the morning when I get up, I can't remember what I thought. <laughs> so that doesn't help me at all. I guess Pastor said something about put a notepad next to your bed, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, the scripture for this morning, there's several of them. Luke 12, 33, through 30, 33 and 34. And this is a lot what we uh, talked about in um, Vacation Bible School, actually. Your treasure in heaven will never fail. For where your travel is, treasure is, there your heart will, also, will be also. Hmm. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. One day a man found the treasure, and then he hid it in the field again. The man was very happy to find the treasure. He went and sold everything that he owned to buy that field. Matthew 6, 21. Your heart will be where your treasure is. And Matthew 19, 21. If you want to be perfect, then go and sell all the things you own Give the money to the poor. If you do this, you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. So be it. So my wife asked me, and Polly asked me, and nobody else asked me then, okay? There's nothing wrong with me today. But they both asked me that. I got a little headache. I think maybe I'm just coming down off a of kid high. <laughs> so I think we should get up first and let's do the songs you want to. <laughs> yeah, we finished with Hallelujah, and I didn't realize that a lot of my boys left to go to a sporting event or something so if my voice gives out on me also it's because you know I was yelling and screaming at the top of my lungs but let's start with prayer father in heaven we thank you we praise you we adore you Lord that you would create us that knowing that it would cost you the life of your son knowing that we would disobey you but that you love us so much that you're so faithful, so true, so kind, and I could go on and on and on. And that wouldn't even touch the surface of the greatness that you are, Lord. Lord, open up our hearts and open up our minds to hear the truth. To seek you as little children seek the truth, Father. To not be distracted by this world. To not let other things compete for our heart. But to love you and live a life of worth with every breath that we have until we meet Jesus face to face. We ask this in His precious name. Amen. So I entitled this Digging Deeper, because last week we were talking about going into VBS and digging for the truth. And you've heard good things about VBS already. We had exactly who needed to be here. Seeds have been planted. If you prayed going into this, thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't stop now. Keep praying. Pray for the seeds that have been planted. And there have been a lot of them planted, and we've seen some. We took for our, <clears throat> for our theme song, and we took Father Abraham and changed the words a little bit. And I'm just going to use an example of Kira, because she's here, and she was here, and she's six. Kira's my granddaughter, if you don't know it. And you get those things in your head, and I go back over, and I'm with her, and I'm singing... Father Abraham had many sons. She said, that's not how it goes, Papa. It's be careful what you wish for, for where your, tre your, uh, your treasure is where your heart is. And I'm like, yeah, the seeds are being planted. 
and we saw that all throughout the week. We saw fun, and we saw their hearts and minds opening up to what was true treasure. And yeah, we went, I went out of my comfort zone. I know she went out of her comfort zone. My heels hurt, my legs hurt. I even thought yesterday, Nathan, he's like my son. He's like an adopted son. He works with me. And he always comes up and pokes me right here. He says, what's this? That's flabby, mushy. That, what's that? And he came by and he said, ooh, that's gone away. You must have been doing a lot during vacation Bible school. And I was like, oh, I need to do this more often then. And then I reached back and that's still there, guys. <laughs> and don't change that easy. But I had some aching knees and bones and everything else afterwards. But we had a great time. But as you're doing this, you know, and I know every worker that's here knows this, and as you serve, it opens up your heart and you see where true treasure is, where true joy is. That you leave the things of this world behind and you don't worry about them to tell others about Jesus. And there's such a blessing with telling these little ones about Jesus. That we've got to dig deeper. Because here I am teaching these concepts, Jesus' words, to, to the children, and, and i got to think to myself, am I listening to Jesus' words? Or do a lot of times they go in one ear and out of the other? Because I use all these things that distract me, and I say it all the time, but yet I get distracted by everything. If I could do vacation Bible school every day till the day I died, what's wrong with that? And what a blessing it would be. And what treasure I would be building in heaven where it's safe, it will never fail, it's for all eternity. And I'll be hearing one day, well done, my good and faithful servant. What else in life is more important than that, honestly? And to know that my grandchild was here, and I get my others in here, and, and I need to spend as much time as I can writing those things on the doorposts of my, of my house and teaching them every chance I get. So we're going over those verses again. Our theme verse was Luke 12, 33 and 34, and we just condensed it to your treasure in heaven will never fail. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that concept was a little vague to them at the first week, but by the end of the week they got it. If it took riding in on a tricycle and throwing a temper tantrum on the floor, I did that too. And Sherry running up and stealing the tricycle to the point where we, Shirley and I, not Judy... <laughs> Shirley and I sold our tricycles and went to follow Jesus because the things didn't matter of this world. And they got that point. But as an adult, again, I keep thinking so much, did Jesus really mean sell everything? And I know that he doesn't mean that I, need to, I have to sell every physical possession I have, but it hit me more and more as I was teaching them, what do I have in my heart that I treasure more than Jesus? Because I can't follow him the way that I should if I'm holding on to these other treasures. It's, a, it's in conflict. You're either gathering or you're scattering. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. So the first verse for the first day was Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. One day a man found the treasure and then he hid it in the field again. The man was very happy to find the treasure. He went and sold everything that he had to buy that field. There's the pattern that we see Jesus teaching. That nothing can compete with him. If something is competing with him, I need to get rid of it. Whatever that is, I need to sell it. I need to get rid of it. And there's a teaching to give to the poor, which we always try to justify that or whatever we try to do. Well, yeah, I'd give to this person, but they go do this. Then I don't understand grace when I do that, do I? I don't understand God's love and God's mercy because we're all enemies of God when Jesus died for us. But we found hidden in that field a treasure more valuable than anything on this earth a treasure that will never fail, that we found Jesus. And we should be so excited about Him that we don't want to hold on to anything. All we care about is following Him. Matthew 6, 21, reinforced again that your heart will be where your treasure is. And you know that's from the Sermon on the Mount. 
Well, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was preaching to the crowds, but today we're going to look at Luke primarily and see Jesus' teaching to the disciples and see how that's a little different than just the crowds. But he tells the crowds the same thing. He tells them how to live. And Matthew chapter 6 starts out with giving to the needy and goes into more in depth of how to live and not to worry about things of this world and to wherever your, your heart is focused that's where your treasure is going to be. It's what you're going to treasure. But the truth is, because that's why we were digging for truth, that these things that you think are treasure aren't. I mean, Jesus is clear about it. He says, moths will come in and destroy them or thieves will, might take them. You're worried about all these things that are for this life and then it's gone. Versus worrying about things eternal that will bring God glory that will draw people into the kingdom, that will lead them away from eternal death into eternal life. So why would I care about any of these treasures? Why wouldn't I seek the kingdom of God first and all these things will be added unto me anyway? Not they might be added unto me, they will be added unto me. Seek God's kingdom first, the truth, real treasure, treasure that will last. Don't store up treasure on earth. And, wow, wait a minute. I get the point that in my lifetime I'm going to be building one treasure or another. There might be times in this life where I have plenty and there might be times when I'm in need. But if I'm focusing on building this, that's what I'm building. Ups, highs, lows, ups, downs, this is what I'm building. Which means I'm not focusing on building this. Treasures in heaven. Something that I found in a field that was, meant so much to me that I went and sold everything that I had that I could find on that field where that treasure was. And then don't forget that I need to share that treasure. I need to be rich. Oh, there's that story about that rich fool, isn't there? Who thought that treasure was just for him to save up for this lifetime when this lifetime could be over like that. And then the last verse for the, for the week or for the Thursday, was if you want to be perfect, and I hope most of you have studied to be approved workmen who are not ashamed enough. That's a Bible verse for everyone, is right? Second Timothy. That to know that perfect doesn't mean, which I explained to them, that I don't do any wrong, because we're all sinners. Even when we're saved, we continue to fight that battle, don't we? We continue to struggle. We continue to forget that Satan has no power in our lives and death has no sting. So why are we worried about this? Why aren't we building up the treasure over here? But if you want to be perfect, which means complete, lacking nothing, then go sell all the things you own. You're already giving it to the poor. You've got compassion and everything else. But there's still something that you're holding on to. Something that you treasure more than Jesus. Get rid of it. And give to the poor. And then when this is gone, the poor can benefit from it because I'm going to tell you it's going to involve riches, power. <laughs> it is going to involve some of that. Pride, whatever it is. Then come and follow Jesus because you've given that away. There's nothing hindering you. Give the money to the poor. If you do this, you will have treasure in heaven. There it is again, though. I skipped that part just a second ago, didn't I? You will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. It's not wrong to desire things, but desire the creator of all things instead of the creation. So there's a three-step process here in Matthew. Three, three, don't miss them, three. And it's here, and it's throughout Scripture. Get rid of anything that hinders you. Go sell everything. Because you can't trust God for daily bread if, if you think you're making it anyway, right? Go sell everything. Give the proceeds to the poor. And the word used here is tohos. That means needy. Doesn't mean that you conditionalize them. <laughs> it means they're in need. Doesn't mean if I spent it all at the liquor store last night. Doesn't mean if I'm lazy. Doesn't mean that, that a, a circumstance befell me that I can't help. This is the person naturally that I would want to help in comparison. It's all together. Whoever has need. It's not for you to judge. It's for you to be gracious, loving, kind. 
so much to the point that they say, I don't understand this Christian, but I want to know more. Sell everything, then give the proceeds of that to the needy. Don't conditionalize it. Don't make it harder than it is. The kingdom of heaven is like a child seeking it. Then your heart won't be divided and you can follow Jesus. So if I've got to do those three things before I can follow Jesus, then I've got to sell everything I have. I've got to give it to the poor. Then my heart's not divided so I can follow Jesus. So our scripture theme was from Luke 12. And hopefully you're familiar with what that chapter is. Well, let's go digging, which means we've got to go backwards a little bit to Luke chapter 11. And Luke chapter 11 starts out this way. Huh, what we might call the Lord's Prayer again. But if you've noticed, it's different. And it's not the Lord's Prayer. That's okay. I'm not saying anything wrong. It's the Lord's model prayer for us teaching us how to pray. But this time it's different than Matthew chapter 6 because Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is just teaching to the crowds. And again, I told you he started out with giving to the needy. But there's a little difference in this because he's, he's teaching his disciples how to pray. One day in a place where Jesus had just finished praying, one of his disciples requested, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples... So Jesus told them, when you pray, say this, Father, ha Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give, it, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Now maybe you've not studied this a little deeper, but I'm going to give you some differences in this. Because again, the audience that Jesus is talking to is different. Matthew is talking to the crowds, hoping that they will follow Jesus. Here in Luke, Jesus is talking to his disciples because they have already understood that they're supposed to give to the poor. They already understand that they're supposed to live differently. They've already understood that they they've given away their occupation to follow Jesus so that they can be like Jesus. That his mission is what is important. So it starts out with, Father, Father hallowed be your name, because that's the purpose, that God's name will be glorified. I, I can't even give you the definition of hallowed because I can't fathom it. Because God is so great, so awesome. And this is so that people will see how great God is. But if you notice, our Father who art in heaven is missing. Who art in heaven. Because the kingdom of God, through the disciples, through Jesus, and then the disciples, and us, because we follow in His footsteps, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. It's here. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They knew that already. So the next part is your kingdom come. We're not worried about the things of this world. We want heaven to come to earth so Jesus will reign, so that he can wipe every tear, so that there will be no more death. We want Jesus literally reigning as king. We know that. So we know we've got to sell everything and not worry about the things of this world. So, Father, give us each day our daily bread. We don't want any more than that so we won't be tempted. We don't need any more than that because we're going to rely on you. And forgive us our, our sins. Now, wait a minute. Is it sins or trespasses or debts? Which one is it? Well, there is a different word here used in Luke than there is in Matthew. Matthew is trespasses or debt owed. It shows an obligation that you have. An obligation that I have to God because I've sinned against Him. An obligation that others have, and I have too, because they've sinned against me. And if I have an obligation of debt, it implies that it needs to be paid. Jesus has paid for all of my sins. There's nothing that I could do to, etern to obtain eternal life to obtain forgiveness from God. But Jesus did it for me. It's finished. If I put my faith in Him, if I believe in Him, then that's done. For we are also forgive everyone who sins against us. Don't help us with it. We're doing it, but we need help. We put it in our prayers. because We're putting this into practice. We're even trying to put into practice that thing that Merle always talks about, forgiving our enemies. We're, do we're doing this. But we're not doing it on our own. We're doing it because you're doing it through us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but the deliver us from evil, from the evil one is not there because we realize that we have been delivered already. We still need help though because we don't want to be tempted by the things of the world that will hinder us from our mission and we don't want to be building up treasure here. We want to be building up treasure here. So we still pray to our Heavenly Father to help us to lead us not into temptation. After the prayer of Matthew chapter 6, there's this added, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their trespassers, neither will your heavenly Father forgive yours. That's not found in Luke. Because I understand that again. If I can't forgive others, boy, is that going to hinder me from the kingdom of heaven, isn't it? Because I'm not going to give to the needy. I'm going to justify who gets the money and who doesn't. I'm going to hold on to my own just in case because I'm not going to trust God. My relationship... Is not going to be where nothing hinders me where I can follow Jesus. Any child can help you figure that out if you can't figure it out. Forgive us of our sins. Matthew uses the word, and I'm going to try to do the Greek pronunciation correctly here. Ophelimia. Ophelimia. Probably butchered it. That's okay. That debt owed because of an offense. The problem in this world is not greed, not drunkenness, not anything else. It's sin. Sin. Whatever it is from not loving the Lord with all my heart to being a drunkard, to being a murderer. That's why Jesus said, if you've thought those things in your heart, you're already guilty of it. A debt that I cannot pay but Jesus paid it for me. Isn't that treasure? Wow. I would be condemned to be apart from God for all eternity to be punished for my sins. But because God loved me so much, He sent His one and only Son to die for my sins, that if I believe in Him, I will not perish but have everlasting life. What treasure would I want to hold on to? It would keep me from the treasure of knowing Jesus. Oh, it makes a little bit more sense why I need to go sell everything so that I can follow Jesus. There's a debt and there's a debtor in each one, though. Matthew uses the Ophelima and Ophelites. Same basic word. Where Luke uses Hamartia. You understood it enough. He shook his head. So I know I got it close enough that he understood it. And then it uses Ophelia. Because sometimes, some commentary, some people think that Matthew's just talking about monetary when he's talking to the crowds. He's not. He's talking about the same thing, sin. You have a sin debt. And Luke makes it clear because we've got more understanding as disciples that we've got this sin debt and we know Jesus paid the price. And if we know Jesus paid the price, then we live differently. We don't live for the king of this world anymore because he has no authority or any power. And we're certainly not going to build up treasures in this kingdom. We're going to build them up for King Jesus for all eternity. We're not going to be hypocrites, blind leaders leading the blind to destruction. We're going to be leading them to Jesus Christ, which means I have to live a different life so that they see Christ living in me. That word means sin but it also means missing the mark. It's a term of archery and everything that I'm shooting for the bullseye, aren't I? Especially if I'm competing, the best shot, the most accurate shot wins. And I've missed. All have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious standard. But now I have been forgiven and given a chance to live a life where I can live a life hitting the mark. Wow. That's why Scripture tells us that our, to be complete, but also tells us that John tells us that we're supposed to be a child of love and that we shouldn't even sin, that... that 
that God wants us to be sanctified through and through by His Spirit, by His Word. And the disciples realize this, so Jesus is teaching them how to pray. That they need to continue to put these things in practice, that they have the power. For we're also forgiving everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Then he goes into this story about how to pray. That neighbor keeps knocking, keeps knocking. He wants some bread, right? Let, let's, let's read it. Suppose one of you goes to a friend at midnight and says, I'm in verse 5 of Luke chapter 11, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Oh, I'm getting to thinking now. I'm supposed to lend without expecting payment in return. The crowd's already heard these words and everything. Because a friend of mine, okay, this is a friend at least, not an enemy, has come to me, has come to me on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. Well, you should have planned ahead. Why don't you have any bread for your friend? No, I don't, I'm not thinking of any of these things. But I am thinking, I don't want to get up and wait on this guy. Let's keep going. Suppose the one inside answers, Do not bother me. My door is already shut and my children are in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up to provide for him because of his friendship, because I've, I've let that already, I'm not worried about that. Yet because of the man's persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Verse 9, so I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you, which is a continuous. Continue to knock, continue to ask to the point where you're annoying. Continue seeking and eventually it will be given to you. If the neighbor will do this, put it into a principle for heaven and asking your heavenly father. Not to be annoying, but to show him how much you're wanting his kingdom come, his will done. Verse 10, For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. For, whatever, for what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Keep praying for VBS. Keep praying for a revival. Keep praying for this church. So I'm going to ask these questions. We ask questions each day too. What is truth? Where are you building your treasure? Ask at the end, you know, would you do that differently? Why are we praying? Why are you praying? What are you praying for? Are you praying in this pattern relentlessly with passion? Expecting an answer. <laughs> now, are your prayers being answered? Give you some time there because if you're like me, First thing that went through my mind is, well, yeah, yeah, but some aren't. Maybe you didn't think that. Maybe you're a lot better than I am. <laughs> Good for you. But I like my way. <laughs> I want my, my will to be done. I still struggle with that. Are my prayers being answered? Well, let's, let's read the last verse in that passage. So if you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? As we go on and read some more in Acts, which we will, we'll understand that persecution comes into the church, and big time, to the point of you know, burning Christians for human lampposts. And they did not pray that the persecution be taken away. They prayed for boldness, to preach the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. Wow. The only way you can answer the question of if your prayers are being answered, first of all, you go with the pattern that's here. Don't pray for something selfish. Pray for God's kingdom to come, His will to be done. Are you praying? First of all, you've got to be praying. And are you praying relentlessly with passion? And then the way you're going to see those prayers answered is you're going to see the Holy Spirit doing something. It may be in others, it may be in you. Every time I watch you guys serve, whether it's VBS or Awana or anything else, I see the Holy Spirit working in you. You might not see it, but I do. 
You might see it in me where I didn't see it in me. And hopefully if we keep on doing it, we keep on praying, and we don't worry about the things of this world, which was said earlier, one of the concerns was, oh, what are we going to do about social distancing and masks and stuff and the new virus? Got... We just put that in God's hands. Now, I'm, not saying don't, I'm not saying don't look at those issues. I don't go out in front of a bus and say, Lord, I know that you're not going to take me away right now. Okay? We will deal with those things as they come, but we're making a plan now that we had VBS where others had concerns not to, that God would take care of it, and we need to pray for it. And if persecution comes, we need to pray even harder for boldness to preach to them. Not what are we going to do because there's a virus or anything else, but boldness to preach the gospel message. Maybe it takes different ways to do it. I don't know. But the mission is to live like Jesus in this world and to make Him known. But that's our motto for our church, right? So Awanas is coming up. If you're not going to do Awana, please tell me if you're doing it. I'm, a, I'm assuming you all are and we'll, we'll do that. And if you don't know, that's the last Wednesday of September when we start. Be praying for that. And you might not see these prayers answered today, but it might be one of my favorite songs is that Sunday school song. I don't know what it's called exactly, but the guy gets to heaven. He didn't think he had done anything with his life, and then he sees this person comes up. It was in your Sunday school class when you were praying that I decided to follow Jesus and everything. Then he looks, and he sees a line, a line of people. He had no idea about the treasure in this earth because it looked like... He had no idea about the treasure over here even because he didn't see it while he was alive. But he was building treasure in heaven that would never, ever fail. A line of people. Because we don't worry about the things of this world. We don't even worry about daily bread, what we're going to wear, or anything else. We worry about making Jesus known. And we have to live a life that's not hypocrisy. A life that's like Jesus. He is the one that paid our debt for us and saved us from the gates of hell. So I have to ask you then, is the Spirit producing fruit in you? Examine yourself. Because if you pray persistently, if you pray passionately for God's will and His kingdom, then you should be seeing Him changing you from the inside out. The next part of Luke 11, and I'm using headers now that come from the Bearing Study Bible, is a house divided. And that's where we re read the verse in verse 23, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather, scatters. Then the next header uh, in Luke 11 is an unclean spirit returns. Verse 26 says, then that spirit goes and brings seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and dwell there. And the final plight of the man is worse than the first. I don't want to be there. Then the next title is true blessedness. Verse 28, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Then there's the sign of Jonah. In verse 32, The men of Nineveh, you know, they are the ones that repented. <laughs> And it was a big long sermon, eight words if you don't remember. Basically repent <laughs> because destruction's coming. The men of Nineveh will stand at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now one greater than Jonah is here. And remember Jonah didn't even want to go. And his disobedience actually led to him making Jesus known to that boat where sailors went all across the world. Kind of like at Pentecost. The next header is the lamp of the body. I'm getting some of these same principles from Matthew chapter 6. But remember, he's talking to his disciples. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a cellar or under a basket. Instead, he sets it on a stand so that, who, so that those who enter can see the light. Verse 35, be careful then that the light within you is not darkness, that you're not fooling yourself. Verse 36, so if your whole body is full of life with no part of it darkness... You will be radiant as though a lamp were shining on you. No holding on to these treasures anymore. You're storing up treasures in heaven and your light shining brightly. Then there's the woe to the Pharisees and the experts of the law in there because we've got to continue to check ourselves so that we're not hypocrites. 
Verse 39, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greediness and wickedness. Verse 52, woe to you experts in the law, for you have taken away the keys to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and have, in, and have entered, hindered those who are entering. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. Then Luke chapter 12 begins this way with 11. 11 compared to the way the church should live versus the way the Pharisees are. In the meantime, the crowd of many thousands had gathered so they were trampling on each other and Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. So the crowds come back, but he's still addressing to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be uh, disclosed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. In verse uh, 5, he starts talking about fearing God alone, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who after, after you have been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Verse 7, And even though the very hairs on your head are numbered, so do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Then Jesus continues, verse 8, about confessing him so that he will confess you. I tell you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will also confess him before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, the rulers and authorities, do not worry about how to defend yourselves or what you will say. For at that time the Holy Spirit will teach you what you should say. He's addressing His disciples because they've chosen to give up the world and they're going to be persecuted for it. Wow, wait a minute, that wasn't in here earlier. It was go sell everything and give it to the poor and then I can follow Jesus. No persecution, right? No. Why would you be surprised if persecution came? They crucified our Lord. Paul says that he longs to know the sufferings of Christ so that he can be made more complete again, more like Christ in his suffering, so that he can know the power of his resurrection and if you'll notice, we're right back to the Holy Spirit. God will give you more of it. We've already taught that in the pattern to pray. The Holy Spirit will even give you the things to say at that time. I know Merle's not here again, but one of the things we discuss is how, how do these people, especially new converts to Christianity, when they're faced in other countries with being martyred and watching their children and spouses being martyred in front of them, how do they not deny Jesus Christ? The Spirit, God gives them tons of it, tells them exactly what to say, and then they're going to heaven. They're not worried about the things of this world because they've decided that Jesus, this treasure that was once hidden, that they have found, is worth everything. Then he tells the parable of that rich fool, right? Who God gave him the things of this earth, and God gave him an abundance and he said, what will I do with it? I'll tell you what, I'll store it up for treasure for myself. If you're not getting the point here, <laughs> it's pretty clear the children will get this point by now. <laughs> Don't store treasures in heaven. I mean, in, on earth, sorry. Store them in heaven where they'll never fail. Your heart is where your treasure is. Focus on this with everything that you have. Next section is do not worry. We've already been taught to fear God alone. Do not worry. Verse 22, Then Jesus said to His disciples, Listen up. Be careful. This is directed back to those who say they believe. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about, the, about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than that. The world might not know that, but you know that. Life is more than that. And then you get down to verse 30. For the Gentiles of the world strive after these things, and your Father knows you need them. What good Father won't give you? If you seek the kingdom of heaven, He'll add these things to you, but don't be concerned about these things. Verse 31, but, complete opposite, seek His kingdom, and plus you'll get all these things added to you. 
Plus, don't forget, you'll be building treasures in heaven where you might, just might, see people lying out the door that said, thank you. Thank you. Matthew 19, 21. If you want to be perfect, complete, lacking nothing, which was the end of our EBS, it's not just storing up treasures in heaven, not knowing the truth about Jesus, but if you want to be complete, this is how we ended the VBS. Then go sell all the things you have. Give to the poor. You won't care who you give it to. Give to the needy because there's needy. Jesus said they'll always have you to give. They won't have me. You will have treasures in heaven. And then the end result is to come and follow after him. To forsake all so that you can follow Jesus. Sell everything. Give alms, that's what the word is translated many times, to the needy, then your heart won't be divided and you can follow Jesus. Now I'm going to close with what the next section of Luke 12 is. Ponder this. Because he's preaching to his disciples and you may see it, you may be there in your chapter. But he says, be ready. Because this could happen at any hour. We didn't go there with EBS. We didn't get that far. But that's where we are at today. I've told you all that we taught in EBS and that you, that you need to be complete, lacking nothing. That this, this, this treasure in Jesus is worth more than you can ever fathom. So much more than anything on this world. Even your life, which God gave you and redeemed back, by the way, if you believe in Jesus. But you need to be ready. Because Jesus could return at any hour. Verse 35. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Put it out on the pedestal for all to see. Don't hide it. Don't let it go out. Burn brightly. Verse 38. Even if he comes in the second or third watch late in the middle of the night, when you're tired, you least expect it, and finds them alert, ready, those servants will be blessed. Not might be, they will be. Verse 47, that servant who knows his master's will but does not get ready or follow his instruction will be beaten with many blows. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 48, for everyone who has been given much, much will be required. Boy, I've got to evaluate myself now. I've been given this story about the rich man and what happened to him. I know where I should be buried, building treasure. And I know with childlike mentality that I still struggle in my, my affection, my treasure is divided with this world. For everyone who has been given much, much will be re required. And for him who has been entrusted, oh, that, that sets the bar up even more. That I've been given a trust that I'm responsible for? And for him who has been entrusted with much, even more will be demanded. What can a man give to save his soul? Nothing. Jesus gave it to save your soul, though. Do you believe this? Are you really, truly following his words? And I'm going to add something even here. <laughs> What if we, just like a little kid, truly obey Jesus' words? Would the kingdom of heaven come so much more? I believe we have living proof of that. It's found in Acts chapter 2, isn't it? That they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to giving, to breaking bread, to meeting together. They didn't worry about anything else. And even to the point where some of them sold land and gave the proceeds so that there were no, no needy among them. The kingdom of heaven coming to earth through God's children. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to have VBS here. Lord, we pray for the upcoming Awanas. Lord, we just thank you for children which are a heritage and blessing. And Lord, they're combated so much with things in this world everywhere they turn. 
Tell him to build up other treasures. Tell him that Jesus is alive. There are other ways. I, I can't imagine the things, because I know the things that I was infected with of this world, and they're at their fingertips on their phone and every other media there is, and we're in a country that doesn't want to be one nation under God. It wants to be anything and everything goes, and you, you have a right for it. Oh, Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around this generation. Lord, help us, especially with the kids, that we can come to and touch and be an example, that we live a life of worth to bring glory and honor to you, that we're gathering for the kingdom rather than scattering, that we're not distracted by the things of the world, that we even discard all of it so that nothing hinders us from loving you. And, Lord, we put it in your hands that you will pour out your spirit among your people, that your spirit will convict and turn those. We pray for revival in this Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria and to the utter ends of the earth. And Lord, we just long for the day when Jesus does return. Lord, it seems like we're getting closer and closer and, and help us to be ready for when that day comes. Help us to be seeking you, longing for that day with the expectancy of a true treasure that we have in Jesus. We pray this in His precious name. Amen.